Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Um, now, I want to welcome uh, representatives or representative Mr. Gary Mann from the Queensland Trucking Association. And you know how we are here, Gary. Name and address, rank and file number and all that sort of stuff. Are you appearing of and then we'll go to an opening statement, mate. Uh, thank you, Senator Stuhl. Uh, my name is, for the purpose of the committee, um, my name is Gary Mann. I'm the CEO of the Queensland Trucking Association. Thank you. Uh, do I have to say, Mr Mann? I don't have to say that, do I? Gary, can you give us an opening uh, statement, please? Because what I do want to do, I've read your submission. In fact, I've read your submission twice. I just can't find it at the moment. I read it when it came in and I read it on the plane coming over the other day. And I have to tell you, I think that is one of the best submissions that we've received. And I, tongue in cheek, I could probably just put recommendations, take off QTA and say the RAP committee. But I think it's very, very important that we go through as much as we can. Now, with Nat Rhodes gone, can we keep you for an hour? Uh, yes, sure. Be good. Yeah. There you go. I'm just giving you a heads up. You're not escaping. Um, but please, opening statement. Then I've got a number of questions and I hope my colleagues can um, follow as well. Thank you, Senator Stuhl. I would like to make an opening statement on behalf of our association. The road freight industry is vital for the operation and survival of the vast geographical footprint of communities and businesses across the nation. The reliance on the road freight industry has never been more profound due to the extensive and ongoing impacts of the COVID-19 economic crisis, with disrupted global supply chains, simmering trade tensions and weaker demand. We need to be competitive on every metric to keep pace on the global map and keep our freight efficiency comparable. Our leading manufacturing and production industries depend on it. While media coverage and public concern are useful in guiding what issues the Australian workforce is facing today, it is important not to respond to regulatory pressure with a knee-jerk, heavy-handed reaction based on media hype and regulatory responses from various agencies. Instead, we should pay due regard to the practical effects of regulatory reform and avoid the law of inadvertent consequences. The prevailing opinion held within our membership is that the complexity in current modern awards means the safety net system is not achieving its goals. QTA supports the simplification and to some extent standardisation of minimum employment standards. As well as benefiting employers, employees would be better placed to know their entitlements. Our members view the modern award system as unduly complex. Transport and logistic companies often employ few in head office positions and are regularly faced with HR resource limitations. We support a simplification of the award system, including adopting more standard clauses and figures across awards and reducing employee classifications. The removal of technical clauses and the corresponding broadening of flexibility arrangements would honour the freedoms of people to agree to their working conditions. We have previously tabled a submission for the consideration of the committee and we thank the committee for the opportunity to give evidence today. I was expecting to then receive questions. I wasn't proposing to go through our submission sure. because I did canvas quite a broad range of, of matters that affect the industry and um, came along today expecting uh, plenty of questions. Thanks All right. very much. Gary, look, I'm, I'm keen for my colleagues to get questions in rather than me try and uh, uh, take all the time. And Senator Hanson is on a time schedule. So, Senator Hanson, did you have any questions you want me to kick off and then we'll go to? Um, no, well, you kick off because I'm right. the first time I've actually sure. seen this. Let's go, to the, let's go to the awards and what we've heard today, Gary, and which we all know is, is the case out there. And as I'd said with that, fear of sound like a broken record. The majority of our industry are decent working, decent men and women working their, their, their backsides off. Yeah. But their kids through school pay off their mortgage and have a, a great life. But unfortunately, it is well known in this industry that, that in my words, that you are what you. There is a reward in this nation to do the wrong thing. I'd be very interested in, not only you talked about the award, the award stuff that, that I hadn't seen that one but this is since COVID of course but 
What about the enforcement of the world? Oh, sorry, more seriously, the lack of enforcement. Because you have thousands of members, or whatever they, how many members you have, you want to protect your members, but how do we protect members when there clearly are rat bags doing the wrong thing and not getting pulled up? Uh, thanks, Senator Stirl. I, I am glad you acknowledge that the, the broader proportion of employers do try pretty hard to do the right thing. Yep. Uh, but that's not to say that there's not some honest mistaken belief in regard to a variety of things. And that sort of teases out the issue around the award system in a lot of cases. It's, it's a very complex set of arrangements to work with. Uh, and there can be plenty of uh, honest but mistaken belief. And I have said that too. Occurs in yeah. that space. Yeah. And, and there is an idea I'll put forward that I think could be considered by government in that space. But I would like to take the opportunity today to make a few comments uh, from our industry. And that is, we don't buy the policy rhetoric around chain of responsibility. I've heard a lot of evidence given this morning that fundamentally the consistent thread is drivers, drivers, drivers and drivers. Well, you're not going to solve this structural problem by continuing to focus your efforts just on the truck drivers because they're at the receiving end. With chain of responsibility, I'd pose this question. If you tallied up every penalty that was applied to road freight today across this country, what percentage would apply to someone other than a truck driver? I would suggest to you it's probably zero, and on random days it might be less than 1%. So here we are in 2020 with a lot of policy rhetoric about chain responsibility and no action. The banking system didn't get its treatment recently, if I regard to it as its treatment, by various institutions focusing on bank tellers. They went up the chain. And I think it's a, a, a reasonable metaphor to draw a comparison about an industry that's 80 odd years old in this country, 80, 85 years old, still the focus in all of the treatments is on truck drivers. When a truck driver gets in a truck to go down the road in this country today, they need to understand in the vicinity of about 2,400 pages of legislation. If you take the logbook legislation, it was introduced into Queensland in 1938. That's about seven years before we produ mass produced ballpoint pens. And here we are in 2020, and our regulatory st system is still structured around this notion of writing something in a notebook as to what you're doing with your day. We've got extraordinarily good technology available to us. We've heard commentary this morning about uh, seeing machines, that there are other technologies around. Seeing machines is certainly well up there in terms of um, leading in that space. Why is that not properly reflected in the law? Why are we not advancing the way we actually manage road safety in this country? I would argue, and I've, I did spend seven years as, as the executive director responsible for road safety in this state back in the earlier 2000s, I am absolutely certain products like seeing machines are a step change in road safety in this country. Yeah. Exactly the same as random breath testing, speed cameras and some other yeah. what are sometimes described as silver bullet treatments. As it happens, I am a member of the expert panel that's overviewing the review of the heavy vehicle national law. But what we need is the, the leadership from the political realm to, to undertake commentary in the public space to reassure people that we're actually moving forward into technology and we're not giving something up by taking logbooks away. There's an, there's an unrealistic reliance that people think somehow logbooks are solving the problem and that if we give up logbooks, we're giving something up in road safety, when in actual fact we're advancing considerably in terms of um, introducing technology into that space so that we can properly manage in real time fatigue of, of uh, truck drivers. When, when you look at uh, enforcement theory, one of the principles is whatever population it is that you're looking to affect or, or encourage to comply with something is to find the turnstile through which they walk. A good example of that is one touch payroll. One Touch Payroll has, has substantially advanced the payment of proper wages in this country, 
because of the way that all of those systems come through the, that turnstile at the end through ATA, through the One Touch payroll system. Somewhat tongue in cheek, I would suggest a lot of that compliance that's been forthcoming has not been from a moral revelation. It's, it's been because the system is now properly examining the way all of that information feeds through the pot. So my, my poser, I suppose, is that why are we not properly addressing the influence of clients in the overall structural context within which road freight operates? So I'm encouraging a, a broader discussion about the way we properly uh, embrace the structural context, that we look at uh, different treatments for the way we examine um, you know, contract management and, and a variety of those sorts of elements of the way our supply chain works, uh, rather than the continuing focus on trying to treat everything by imposing our enforcement will upon truck drivers who, are, who in the end are at the receiving end of every element of the chain. I don't have an argument with what you're saying, Gary, but I think, you know, we don't have one silver bullet, because if we had one no, silver bullet, it would be magnificent. Anything that enhances road safety, no one would argue against, we all say that. But we've got to come back to the fundamentals, and let's, let's, let's drill down on this. The truth of the matter is, is we all know that we are an industry, I still say we, I'm, I'm not in it anymore, but you are an industry that is price takers. You're price takers, it's yep. pretty simple. And I've been very vocal on this, and I've never retracted from this. The top of the supply debt chain is where we need to, to focus. Absolutely. So in your submission, and it goes to 3.46, a, a lack of reliable... 3.46, not sick, sorry. Lack of reliable pricing calculators. We talked about the, the users of road transport need to be held accountable on the COR, which you did talk about. But you also, and you're not the only one, who are advocating for a mandatory code of conduct or mandatory code. I really want to hear what that mandatory code would address and what would it be made up of? Let's have a, let's have a go at that. Well, we contend that uh, the Competition and Consumer Act could be amended, particularly uh, Section Part 4B. Part uh, 4B, sorry. To, um, what is that? To in include a code that, uh, in particular, covered payment terms Mm -hmm. uh, it could also incorporate uh, a schedule of uh, minimum costs. So, sorry, Gary, payment terms as in uh, pay, me uh, pay me an hour after I've done the or 30 days. Yes, that's okay. it. Yep, right. Um, there's, uh, there's, there's a, a variety of things that you could put in that code. We, we think there's some merit in that Victorian uh, Forestry, Contractors, mm -hmm. Forestry Contractors Act where yep. they introduce a schedule of minimum costs for, for uh, freight. Mm -hmm which uh, is a quite different notion to where the RSRT was going, but uh, fundamentally it, it would be something you need to be refreshed uh, annually, uh, where there's simply a schedule of, of costs yep. for, for freight. So that Instant at variable. least yeah, okay. is a guiding hand to um, mm -hmm. the way uh, contracts uh, might ordinarily be struck. Uh, and it also gives uh, some relevance to people to be able to draw a comparison to it. Um, we, you know, we we are strong believers in um, you know a market economy, yeah. and uh, competition is a healthy thing for our economy. But at the same time, um, it's not unreasonable to expect that you could put some minimum standards in a schedule uh, or minimum costs, sure. uh, so that there's a proper understanding of uh, what it takes to actually operate a, a truck down a road to move freight from A to yeah. B. So, Gary, as part of that too, we, we couldn't turn a blind eye to the lack of enforcement of the minimum award standards too. Does your mandatory code embrace that? Because it's all very well if we have all that. But I also want to ask about enforcement of how would you see that being enforced? Again, I just want to reinforce uh, attention needs to go up the chain. Um, if I could use another metaphor, you, you're not going to solve a mouse plague with cats. And if you look at the construct of the way we look at road freight at the moment, we just try to employ more cats and we try to employ more ways of, of treating the individual rather than having some structural solutions put into play. So we need some mechanisms put into play that monitor how contracts are struck. How we, 
like when you look at the banking metaphor again, or the banking example, I should say, it was Austrac that looked at the banking system. And that was where fundamentally the whole process really started, I, I would argue. Um, we, we don't bring that sort of attention to the freight system or the, or the uh, supply chain in this country. We, we always default to orthodoxy and go to on-road enforcement. Oh, there's no argument. There's we absolutely need... Proof. So we need, we need some different mm. constructs in the likes of, say, ASIC, uh, under comp competition law, pot potentially the ACCC, so that they actually focus their optics on the supply chain, the same as they do to other industries, so that there is um, uh, more attention given to the, the nature and conduct of behaviour right through the chain. Sure, out on the road, there needs to be some enforcement for behaviour um, as it happens, you know, of the individual. Yeah. But if you're really going to look at the construct of the system, you need to change the nature of the way we look at the law and where we intervene and by how much. Um, almost all solutions for the last 85 years follows an orthodoxy that it's all going to be solved in an on-road environment enforcing what you might call heavy vehicle law. Yeah, and what we could also look there too, and I'm lucky I've come from Western Australia and I only ran over here about 20 times and that was 19 times too many. Uh, I mean, across the Nullarbor because of the, oh, the, 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 the enforcement, the coppers, and I'll say this, the coppers are no mates of the trucking industry in certain states of Australia. New South, I want to say coppers, not only coppers, RMS and that you heard it, you know. But in WA, we didn't have that. The coppers didn't give us hassle, you know. We were lucky in WA. But go back to this. It was it's the easy it's the easy pick, the low-hanging fruit. And you've heard me say on a number of occasions, every time a key goes in the ignition, some bugger's got their finger in the bloody pocket, you know, whether it's governments or government agencies and all that. But coming back to the mandatory code sort of thing. So as I'd said very clearly, Gary, and you've heard this, and if there had been a change at the last election, I don't re re retract on this. Whatever a transport operator charges was of no business of mine. My only concern was if there was contractors used or wage employees, then, the, then there is protections that need to be put in place. So if they had a mandatory code of conduct, how would that be, sorry, come back to it. How would it be enforced? And you're just saying, there's a certain standard of charges you can't go below. How would that? Well, I think there's other actors in the system that currently uh, don't have any presence in our space. Um, the ACCC, yep. ASIC, mm -hmm. um, it doesn't all fall to... The NHVR has a role, but I would argue there are other actors in, in this construct that fundamentally are not present. Um, and ASIC and uh, the ACCC would be two I would point to. Yep. Uh, because if you put, if you put the, the legislative construct in, in consumer and competition law, we had had then a reasonable expectation that that some supervision is going to occur uh, and or interrogation of the conduct of that chain mm. by those parties. Or, or, so it's not all um, falling back on a role like the NHBR uh, yeah. because their, their remit only extends to, uh, you know, a, a portion of, of um, uh, the broader sort of construct of the supply chain. Yep, and of course uh, that would come with relevant funding too. It to would make need sure to be, that, yes. that would help. So, Gary, let's just, just give us an overview clearly. Um, how is the industry in Queensland? When I say how is the industry, and I'm referring to your, you know, there, there, there's some certain pressures. Have the pressures got greater over the last few years, or has it been a constant? See, we, I can't find the figure here, but I think you mentioned you mentioned the figure of how many transport companies have gone broke. The transport operators. Can you remember that number? So what I'm trying to lead to, is it got any worse? Is it getting better? Is it still bubbling along at the same rate? Um, well, there's a few facts and figures I, uh, I did outline in there. Um, it's in the order of about 13,000 businesses have gone mm, to the wall. 13,754. Of, oh, there you go. of uh, yeah. the, the last couple of years. Yeah. Um, currently, uh, when you look at expenses and uh, revenue over the last five years, uh, fundamentally for every dollar uh, our freight industry has gone up in revenue. We've gone up about a dollar eighty-one in expenses. Mm. So, arguably, freight rates have not changed much in the last fifteen years. 
So uh, uh, what's happened is expenses are eating and eating and eating further into the freight rates. Uh, so that um, as a sweeping generalisation, I would suggest that most road freight businesses uh, would have had a good year if they're in the vicinity of four to five cents on the dollar net. That much? That bet, much? On oh, net, 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 sorry. So uh, <laughs> when you look at a business that's uh, very high in capital uh, expenditure, very high in operating expenses, very low margins across a range of um, places where they can make a little bit. So it's the nature of an industry where you get a chip here, a chip there, and a chip there, and a chip there, and out of that, you come up with five cents, four or five cents net on on the dollar. So that's that's the very nature of the, the sort of the fabric of the industry or its DNA. Um, you know, there was a time, you know, 15 years ago, they were doing better than that. But expenses, as I said, just keep coming up. Rates are staying comparatively similar. I was talking to a major employer on the West Coast uh, not that long ago, uh, and I mean a major employer, and I don't mean one of the two usual suspects. And, uh, this company's huge. Um, and they said their survival margin depends on a headwind. Now, I, I, and I, I know exactly what that means. I have, uh, I have heard those those stories, um, there's plenty of people who would be down around two or three cents. Yeah. Um, I'm saying, you know, a, a well-run company in, in um, good space, you know, four to five cents. You can go to the ASX list and see any number of the large large ones are in that same sort of range. Um, there's 62,500 people employed in transport and logistics in Queensland. Um, 62,500. 62,500 in TNL in Queensland. Mm -hmm. um, you're looking at about, by our calculation, about 14% of those are probably running at a loss um, on, on the basis of the of when you do the metrics on, on the economic sort of um, um, assessment of, of, of the industry. So that's, that's pretty tight conditions. Uh, when you look at COVID-19 at the moment, all of our people have, have absorbed a lot of extra cost um, in terms of everything from PPE to processes to training. Um, mm. Uh, the impact has had on um, timings and so forth across borders, extra drivers need to be in, engaged, staging having to be introduced more widely. There's a whole variety of uh, treatments that have had to be brought into that space. Uh, we are starting to see uh, more and more redundancies now, particularly in, in the back end. Oh, it's um, coming down. I'm not aware of any mm. drivers, but there's, you still see plenty of ads out for drivers, but certainly in the back end of operations, schedulers, allocators, you know, HR, uh, warehouse staff and so forth, uh, redundancies are starting to, to uh, come through uh, because volumes are down. Um, lots of people point to supermarkets and the like, and yes, there was a period where those volumes were uh, well up, but uh, there's a lot of other areas. You know, it just, it just follows. Like if you're in retail food or you're providing um, materials into uh, the tourism sector and so forth, you know, all of those volumes are down because all of those industries are really hurting. We are fortunate in one sense in that, um, you know, road, road freight is the fundamental fabric of keeping a, a community supported and, and um, uh, living to a standard. Uh, so there's still a great need for road freight to continue to operate, but volumes are, are, um, are down in, in a raft of areas. So all in all, um, you know, conditions, I think, would, you would be described as tight before um, COVID-19. Um, it, it ebbs and eddies a little. Some people have, you know, slightly better years, some years to other years. But all in all, to maintain your existence in the road freight industry, you have to be very tuned into every single cost to maintain your survival. Right. Now, mm -hmm. Senator Hanson, I want to give you a go because I know that you, um, you your time constrained today, and Senator McDonald, and I want to come back and talk about other things with you. Yeah, there has been a suggestion to actually have a, a, a national body accreditation. Um, is there a lot of cowboys in the industry that come in the industry and actually undermine it and um, for a short period of time and then, you know, puts pressure on, on businesses out there that are doing the right thing? There, there can be, but I would argue the greater majority of employers out there have been around for some time. Uh, there certainly is a percentage of, of cowboys uh, who are prepared to um, do, do whatever it takes at, at any price. Um, and they survive for a little while and, and then they go. I mean, I made reference in my submission to phoenixing. Um, 
you know, that's that's one of the uh, the avenues that the these uh, people of those motivations tend to tend to pursue. I'm I'm certainly not uh, a supporter of the notion of, of licensing. Uh, I think there are other ways uh, that you can treat that so issue. No national accreditation. Well, to a standard. The the test is this: is that it's all very well, you know, it's a it's a sort of a um, uh, an admirable notion. But the practical reality is, once that legislation is struck, if you're sitting on the regulatory side of the fence, my, my challenge would be, you try and make a case that person A is not a fit and proper person to operate a business. My argument is that they'll all get in because they'll make their case because it is extraordinarily difficult to make a case to say that is not a fit and proper person to run a transport business because they'll use the shield of company structures, a whole variety of other mechanisms. So one way or the other, they'll get in and then you'll have this extraordinarily large system of accreditation that's yet another impost on the industry that I would argue is not going to provide much in the way of value. What I would rather see is money spent on um, paying attention to those turnstiles. You know, one touch payroll, I think, is one of the, the better uh, interventions I've seen introduced in, in my time in, in and around this business. Uh, and, and there are others. Um, so if you look at competition law, you look at a code, you look at it looking at mechanisms that actually taking some interest in the quality and calibre of the way contracts are struck, you look at the way uh, the Austrac relationship works with the banking system. You can introduce similar approaches in uh, ASIC and or ACC, ACCC on the conduct of the way clients interact with road freight. Because what I hear too much of is, again, all the focus at the people who are driving on the road end when there is so much influence by the clients because they, in the, in the main, dictate the play. Um, because it's the prices they insist on that somewhat brings about the behaviour that's undertaken. And again, I would rather see treatment more evenly across that chain. Um, well, that would come down I'm to just... a code of conduct, and that's exactly what we're dealing with in the dairy industry at the moment, because the process was screwing the farmers yes. and not paying them the right price that they need to. So you talk about having a code of... of conduct or practice or that you need for the industry. Now, I'm it's a different thing to take it to the next step and then license individuals. You, you can still have people aspire to that code and you can enforce that code yeah. regardless of who is operating in the industry. But if you work the code on, okay, I'm just thinking here, yep. okay, off the top of my head. If you had a code basically saying, okay, if you're, you're I, I suppose most of your trucking organisations, and correct me if I'm wrong, I don't know, you would pri probably have your regular clientele that you'd move stuff for, would you? Re reasonably so. Reasonably so. Okay. So then if you had, if you had a, a, a contracts with them that would be, say, half a million dollars or a million dollars a year or something like that, that they're a regular clientele with you, like you have your farmers with your processes, so you deal with that one person all the time. If there was a code of conduct that was with this this clientele, after you reach a certain amount of money of dealing with them, there has to be a code of conduct that has to be put in place that they can't screw you down on a, on a price. And, that, and that's where you, your transport comes into it, that they must then um, be obligated to pay you a certain price for that, for that we, we support that notion, and that's why we put that forward the, we put the, forward the suggestion that Part 4B would be a good space in competition and consumer law to to reflect that context. Well, I just thought about because that at the moment that's a gap. Head, so I don't know. It, uh, it's something to to flush out and to talk more about. So once you hit a certain price that you're dealing with this company, whether it's Coles or Woolies or someone like that, as soon as you hit that price, that you're doing that continual business with them, then it must be enacted a code of practice so they can't screw you down and it must cover the the realistic cost of doing that cartage. We, we would support that notion. That, that's why we put that forward as a proposition. That 
That's a big step forward. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. You see plenty of action yeah. by those uh, those uh, those regulatory actors in the retail space and a variety of others. That's right. But none whatsoever in the supply chain. And just to also, Senators and Gary, um, on on buoyed by the conversation, absolutely. Um, but to talk about the ACCC, yes, and unfortunately where we've got now, the ACCC are more interested in going to try and pin Frank Black because how dare he write in the big rigs, I think it was, Steve, yes, I got the vote, big rigs, that during COVID now, boys, is not a time to drop our rates. You know, he got a letter threatening that he's uh, 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 price fixing, cartel. Ca a cartel, he's trying to form, uh, anyway, by name a driver, there you go. Okay. So, sorry, Senator Hanson, I came in on the top. Did no, no, that's fine. Me? That's um, And I just, uh, because you, why I led to that is where you've got here in your submission about master contracts and whereas you have the, for example, you get 5000 may be paid by a head contractor and then you've got a subcontractor may get $3,000. Yeah. yeah. And then they're just cutting the price all the time. And, of course, they're trying to do it. Um, there'd be plenty of people operating, particularly as owner drivers, who might be fifth or sixth in the chain. Yep. Just ex so now, now, Gary, explain that. I know exactly what you're talking about. But let's go through that. Well, a master, a master or head or head contract take, takes the initial yeah. uh, uh, contract responsibility or accountability. Uh, they then might trade that off to some other party in the chain, who then trades it off, who then trades it off, who then trades it off. Um, you got uh, freight brokers and others in um, uh, in the middle of that space, and uh, ultimately, um, the person who actually carries that load could be the fifth or sixth person in that chain. So well, they all then take I, a little bit out. The, yeah. Okay. Then, okay. Then I need to ask you about to explain then about your chain of responsibility. I've, I've read this here, but it doesn't really sort of make a lot of sense to me. So. Are you saying the responsibility should still lie in the hands of the one who took out the original contract or it should be at the end? Who's, who should be responsible? Chain of responsibility. The master contract, the person taking the master contract is not blind to what's going on down the chain. They, they understand how that system works. The chain of responsibility is, is written in such a way as it, it's supposed to hold every element of that chain to account. And that's why I put the proposition early on as if if you tallied every penalty that's applied to a freight person in Australia today, I would seriously doubt that it would be less than 1% of non-drivers who've been penalised. 99% plus of penalties that are applied right across this country every day of the week would be on a truck driver. And here we are in 2020, all these years down the track with COR and what we're saying is we're not seeing action with rhetoric. We're hearing a lot of rhetoric, yeah, but, but we're not the, seeing the, the action. The truck driver must be responsible for doing this, these speeding. They're responsible for the, well, their things. own actions. Okay, their own Absolutely. actions like that. Yep. As far as the load on the truck, is it their responsibility then to ensure that, that load is not over? Or if they knock back that heavy load, will they actually could lose their jobs? They, they may or might, yes. That's right, correct. so that they're taking the risk because otherwise so either have a job or don't have a job. And that's what you're telling me. So it, this is where we're talking about the chain of responsibility of how much pressure is put onto the truck drivers and uh, to ensure that they have a job at the end of the day. So I agree with that. If they're forced to do that, the chain of responsibility then is with the person. That's right. Because there is influence coming from down the chain that but, influences the way their behaviour is undertaken. All right. So where does the trucking now go if they've got concerns about that and they've been forced to actually break these laws? Because if they're involved in an accident, that truck is overweight. It doesn't go back to the person who said it. It'll be down to the truckie, wouldn't it? It, it may. It depends on the circumstances of the event, what, what can be proven. So where do they go? Well, th there's a variety of places they can go. They could, they could go to enforcement authorities. Um, they could go to the union, they, they could come to associations, a bit, uh, they could go to um, um, probably the ACCC. Uh, the, there are a variety of, but it's, it, it is complex. And, you know, you heard evidence earlier on this morning is, is that people feel intimidated that there's going to be consequences 
if if they raise those issues. So it's an imperfect system, and we're not going to solve it by even further treatment on truck drivers. What I'm asking for is there needs to be broader consideration to structural change yep. to bring about a better result. Um, Senator MacDonald. Thank you very much. I was smiling when you were talking about, you know, out of date legislation in place. Um, I fought very hard only a couple of years ago to get it um, changed so that it was legal for butcher shops to chain, to trade after lunch on a Saturday and, and on a Sunday, which is, of course, when everybody wants to go shopping these days. So, And it was fascinating reading the legislation. So 1938, I can only begin to imagine how out of date um, the regulation it's, it's the managing logbooks are. It was introduced in 1938 by Premier William Forgan Smith. Right. in Queensland. Other states were on, on or about similar dates mm. uh, and it was two pages. Mm. We now have uh, over 150 pages to explain the same thing. <laughs> There's about 110 offences on those statutes and less than eight of them actually relate to fatigue. The rest are administrative offences. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, the, the, I would argue along the way we've lost the plot because <laughs> It no longer has the focus on the outcome that we're looking to change. Whereas technology like seeing machines and others are actively managing in real time the condition you are in yeah. whilst you are driving down the road. And it gives the employer every opportunity to do something to treat that and, and or support you. All right. Well, I'll be very keen that that be a recommendation out of this inquiry that we modernise the um, that legislation that is outcomes based around you know the outcomes that we're trying to achieve and safety, not administrative pings. Um, I'm also really interested in talking to you more about um, 3.3.2 imbalances in market power to effectively negotiate visible rates. You used a, a fabulous uh, term. Uh, which is that you can't manage a mouse plague with cats, and I'm going to use that often and never ever credit you. Um, so, uh, but it is. A puss in boots. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it is about that there is a structural um, breakdown, and and I would suggest that the market has completely failed. And and so I'm very keen to pursue this idea of a code if you think that will be useful. But I do think going back to you know, the ACCC is completely ineffectual. The, the C for consumer is huge. And whenever we try and have these conversations about any sort of costs, it allows supermarkets and the big play players to talk about cost to consumers. Um, but there's nothing in there about costs to business, costs for um, small uh, business people, for employees, um, you know, agricultural producers. So. Uh, that uh, you already discussed with Senator Hanson about that specific amendment um, to the ACCC uh, legislation. I, I'm really keen that we, we, you know, we address the market failure uh, rather than keep finding band-aids to, I mean, the fact that we've got to legislate that people pay within terms mm. is, a, is a shocking indictment on um, you know, how powerless the ACCC is to address what I would have thought was just standard business practice. So many, many uh, quite a proportion of our industry are small owner operators mm. and they've got, you know, fuel, wages, yep. registration, a whole lot of other, you know, and they're not in a position to, to, uh, to carry no. um, those sorts of costs. And mm. 30 days is not an unreasonable expectation. Well, not You've had when... the work done for you, and we, we're giving you a month to pay us. Because I wasn't getting paid weekly. Mm. Well, particularly when if they don't pay their fuel bills, they can't get filled up. That's right. You know, they've got a very urgent and immediate pressure on paying their bills. But so I, I... not too much credit around for fuel. <laughs> no, 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 very little. So. You know, the, the recommendations that you've made, I agree with Senator Stirl, it's a very, um, uh, you know, your, your, your submission is, I'm sorry, that might have been a previous submission, but it's a great submission that you've, you've made. It's very specific, but I do think the competition element is a bit that's missing because um, whether they be owner operators or bigger players, um, 
the, the increased um, uh, wages, the, the um, technology for safety management, for fatigue management, they all come at a cost which they can't achieve if they're being constantly screwed down on price. So I, I would be keen to, to, for us to work through recommendations that, that allow for those um, appropriate costs to flow through the industry. And, and as an industry, we would ask to have, have the opportunity to, to uh, voice our views in, in that space so that um, we, we could bring some balances to the, the operational um, uh, complexities of uh, putting some of this sort of legislation into play. Yeah. I think what we have noticed too, that there is a greater desire now for all assets of the industry to start working together because I've been at this for 40 years and you keep banging your head against your brick wall, it bloody hurts, mm. you know? But I just want to say this too, Senator McDonald, that there's a, I can't mention names, I will tell you later, but there's a massive um, company, a corporation in this nation mm. that's not an Australian, mm. who has um, thousands of tonnes of freight movements throughout this uh, great country, mm. who have put their transport company on 150 day payments. Uh. And they don't give a fat rat's backside. Tough mm. if you want the work, mm. and I mean seriously. So you know, but even this station, I want to applaud the federal government, and you know, I'll give credit where credit's due. And you and I, and Senator Hanson, we know we voted in the Senate when the government moved to pay within 30 days yes. industries within the defence portfolio. Yes. I'd only urge the government that why stop it? Why stop yes. it? Defence. Right. I also want to talk briefly because Gary, you've mentioned it, phoenixing, which is one of my pet hatreds. But once again, we all were in the Senate and voted where phoenixing within the construction industry. We, mm. we all remember that. We all went through. Yeah. We all voted it. And I yeah. stood up at the time and said, don't stop there. Get into the transport and other associated industries. So look, on, on going along that line, Gary, I've got to throw a curveball at you. I really, you're too slick to get caught here. But anyway, um, and I know that you've got, you're dealing with governments all the time and all that, but this is my observation that I'd, I'd be keen. Is our industry heard in the hallways of Parliament? Oh, I, I Parliament believe. I believe so. I think I think it's getting better all the while. Um, I, I think that's um, reflected, to, in fairness, to the um, uh, the current Queensland government, for sure. example, in yep. in the COVID nineteen circumstances. Uh, you know, we've had good access to the CHO, to departments. Um, police and others, so that we've ended up with good common sense arrangements on our borders and, 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 other, yeah. and other implications. And, and to be fair to both sides of politics, uh, that, that has been, I think, a, you know, a reasonably strong tradition over, over many years. Um, and uh, we, we're not asking, um, what we're asking for is to be heard and for the operational considerations to be taken into account so that, you know, common sense can come into play so that we understand what what is being looked for, and we ensure that that as best as we can, um, that that can be delivered. Uh, in the federal sphere, I think that's improved um, quite a bit uh, over the last um, uh, little while. But you know, again, we're, we're hard markers. We work in a tough industry, um, and we're hard markers. It's it's one thing to be heard, but we also like to see that reflected in action. So. Um, we, we are making uh, some gains in that space. Um, we, uh, we are looking for um, uh, greater priority in terms of uh, road infrastructure investment. Mm -hmm. If you look across this country, um, I would argue that it's fairly hard to identify specifically a road investment that, be, that is being undertaken for the purposes of unlocking productivity in this, in this country. Yes, there's a safety dimension, Yes, there's a variety of other reasons infrastructure may well be invested in, but we also need to unlock uh, productivity across the country. When you look at high, um, um, high productivity vehicles, you know, multi-combinations, Australia is quite unique in the use of multi-combinations, and that's because we're a, an extraordinarily large geography. We're a relatively low population distributed, quite decentralised right across the country. That makes it even stronger imperative to make tonne kilometres as efficient as we possibly can. So with multi-combinations, you know, they're the ones that should be running across what I call the land-based trade routes. 
we, we need um, some change in emphasis on bridge investment and some other investments so that we're actually unlocking those trade routes for better productivity results. When you look at something like an A double at 30 metres versus a B double at 26 metres, for every five B doubles, you can do the work with four A doubles. That's a 20% lift in productivity for freight tonne kilometres for a very small extension of length. Redu reduction of exposure for road safety, reducing the fuel burn, reducing tyre wear, lowering our tonne kilometre costs so that we can be more competitive in our export freight. They're the sorts of considerations we need to bring to commerce as well, because with a growing population and the growing freight, you know, another 26% growth in the next five years or so, we need to come up with more innovative solutions. We, we do have uh, a sort of a demand problem in terms of employees looking to come into road freight. Mm -hmm. um, one, one of the ways to remediate that is we, we can reduce the number of truck trips that are necessary to get the job done. So we need a broader conversation about commerce in this country and about productivity uh, and remaining competitive on the international market. With those sorts of combinations, you attract a higher level of, of uh, qualifications for people to operate that gear. So, you know, it's a, it's a, uh, a fairly significant sort of um, cycle that needs to be considered in everything that we do. Our so, road safety performance is improving all the time, yeah. but, but there's room for improvement. Can I just ask a question yeah, on that? Of course. Yeah, Thank you. Right. So um, I think you make a good point about the, the roads and productivity. So I've been working hard on, you know, funding to go into the Hahn Highway, the Torrens Creek Road, sealing yep. the Duchess to Dajara section, you know, that's bringing a lot of cattle out, a lot of minerals out and then making sure you can get B-doubles into the port of Townsville, into Rocky, you know, and, and it makes a big difference to those abattoirs and businesses that are trying to get, you know, how do they get big uh, trains in? Um, and again, we want to get seven decks on onto road trains coming down from the Gulf as opposed to six. I mean, again, exactly to your point, but these are regulations and legislation at state-based levels um, around truck movements that, and, and road, expenditure that um, so it would be great if we were more focused and we're on We're looking for our percentage. We, mm. we pay out plenty mm. uh, in terms of uh, diesel excise and rego and a whole raft of other ways that um, we... Um, well, just um, on that, so what happens with the introduction of all these electric vehicles and hydrogen vehicles and who's going to be left paying all the road excise if we don't get some... Uh, some... I'm sure governments will find some way of fleecing the public. They're bloody good at it. So, <laughs> can I can I just come? I've got to play a spoiler role here. Okay. Sorry. Um, and this is Glenn Steele, the old truckie talking now. This nation, we have been absolutely brilliant at saying to clients, "How much more cheaper freight can we cut for you?" And we talk about, you know, every time we get an extra foot on a trailer or another pallet, things give. So, how Gary, I'd be very interested to hear your thoughts if your members have a thought on this. How can we in 2020 think that this is um, good business practice that we can have A triples and, you know, and I come from the road training state of WA. You know, we've been road training since Jesus played fullback for Jerusalem, but anyway. Yet we can't have a decent sized sleeper on our prime movers. Well, that's one of the propositions we've put forward um, uh, last year. Uh, allowing a uh, one metre increase on general access vehicles if it's used for a sleeper cab. Um, You've put that to the Queensland Government? Uh, we've put that to the, the Federal Review of the good. Heavy okay. Vehicle National Law. Oh, so okay. um, the last, I, I do like to quote uh, the Productivity Commission in the, the last report they did in shifting the dial. And I think the exact words were, We've had an inexorable decline in productivity to where it came to a standstill in 2004. We have not genuinely had real productivity gains, really, since the 90s. There were a lot of microeconomic reforms introduced in the 90s. From 1988, uh, where we went from 17 metres at 38 tonne, by the end of the 90s, we were running at 19 metres, 42 and a half tonne. We had B-doubles on the road running at 68. When we went from 25 to 26 metre B-doubles, that was 
basically only about being allowed to put a different prime mover in front. The trailer length didn't change. Since, since then, we've not really had any real productivity development in terms of um, the freight task. We had an extraordinary increase in, in the amount of freight being carried. Mm. Uh, we still carry it across the same network of roads. Mm. Uh, PBS vehicles were introduced, but it is extraordinarily difficult to get access to the road system with those PBS vehicles. PBS are world leading design. PBS vehicles are well demonstrated now to give you somewhere between six and eight percent better safety performance as they go down the road. I think there's a, a very good story to tell the general population about for the sake of a few metres more, how much safer that combination is and how it reduces truck trips. So we, we need to have that narrative coming from the political realm to, to help persuade the community that it is a positive thing. And there's a lot of benefits that flow from that, uh, whether it's export costs or, or whether it's uh, safety on the roads, you know, reducing exposure. There's a whole variety of pluses in, in that story. Gary, got, but we to, need the access. I've got to come back. I've got to come back, mate, because all I can remember my days on the road was sitting in a... What's a daisy? A, no, it was a word. A eight foot by seven foot fiberglass yep. steel box. And my bunk was no bigger than a parcel shelf. And yet, every time we had a game, the industry would be jumping for joy because we could now pull triples closer to Perth yep. or we could now start road training across the Nullarbor. Everything came at the expense, the same old eight foot by seven foot box of nuts and bolts with a parcel shelf bunk that I lived in, I worked in it, I slept in it, I ate in it for 20 odd hours a day. And in 2020, we still can't. I think there's a nation really... be mature enough to say, hang on, we need to get these. There's, these bloody trucks are decent there's, for the guys and girls in there. There's very much room within the regulations to, to put boundaries around trailer lengths within the overall combination. There's an axle mass spacing formula to protect bridges. You could apply a similar formula for the, the proportion of uh, trailer length within overall length so that you're leaving room for prime movers to have a decent sleeper on them. You do need to control that, though, because you don't want to go to the American experience where... Who doesn't want to go? <laughs> the prime movers as long as the trailer. So that, that brings sorry, about a whole lot of other who, set of problems. Who's we? Who, who knows? Oh, okay. I'm just... The, le the, lesson, the lesson from the American experience is that they don't put boundaries on the overall length. So uh, in our case, there are plenty of prime movers around that are available with decent sleeper accommodation but they are inhibited by the length requirements. You could introduce a rule that controls trail length along with overall length so that prime movers can have decent sleepers. Yeah, and I think, look, you know, and I understand the American thing because they're great to look at, but manoeuvring around the cities would be quite interesting at times, but that's not the point. I mean, you know, and I'll, I'll look at our line or when I was up north last week, up the real north in the West Australia, and anyway, um, the week before last, and the amount of the line haul, you know, the Volvos play a large role there, you know, and, and those bunk, the cabs are huge. The bunks are tiny. And I'm thinking to myself, in this day and age, really, are we still in that, in that era where we expect our truckies to squeeze into, you know, I mean, the Hansard can't pick up the distance in my hands, but what's that, 18 inches? So this, this is very confronting for governments to consider, but my, my poser would also be that We've had logbook rules in this country now for 82 years. Uh, in your half of the country, not ours. <laughs> why, why can you not drive around this country on the major routes and find a decent truck stop every two hours? That's right. We've only had 82 years to do it. Yeah, that's right. So mm. it goes hand in hand. There's a huge expectation and imposition of the enforcement of logbook rules, but you also need to provide facilities for them to be able to do that. Mm. So. Yes, you need a decent sleeper. Um, you know, ice boxes and so forth are becoming more and more common. Yep. Um, are a reasonable size in terms of the, the nature of the accommodation, yes. But you've got to be able to pull up too and, and have, you know, some decent opportunity for R&R &R and not be 
unduly sharing that with, um, you know, caravans or generators or, or, or a whole lot of other things. That will start a whole new argument very soon, but yes, you're right. But there's yeah. a lot of low-hanging fruit in this, in this nation, is. you know, and we've talked about this, uh, and, and, and I've had a number of conversations. This is not reinventing the wheel. This is not putting Australia's national debt even further into the quagmire. It's low-hanging fruit in this nation. And we talk about, it. and I don't care what any politician says or any bureaucrat, it does not cost an arm and a leg for this nation to build truck bays. And yet, Gary, and I've seen I have to be, and I've got some questions for the, for the state government, and I did the Toowoomba bypass, and I saw a lot of politicians with high-vis vests having photos of walking this magnificent piece of infrastructure. The first thing that got me is, who the hell designed this? Where the hell is a truck going to pull up if it breaks down on the side of the road? Because three plastic triangles with three red reflectors on is not going to save some poor bugger come flying up behind and kill themselves. But even simple infrastructure, where is, where in this nation, where are we consulting? I had this blue with Oz roads the other day that went nowhere. Where are we consulting the men and women who use these roads about how do we build these roads but initiate safety, put safety initiatives into these projects? There's nothing, is there? The industry's not consulted. We'd certainly see, need to see more of it. Yeah. But isn't okay. that uh, a lot to do with the state putting that in? I mean, so your reg, uh, registration is paid in the state, so I understand the fuel excise you pay the federal government, but uh, what are the states? What's their, what's their say on this, putting in truck stops? Well, it is a state responsibility. I mean, the road managers around the respective states and territories yeah. uh, are the state and or territory uh, responsibility. The, the federal government does pump a fair bit of money in uh, for uh, national corridors. So there is a, a partnership in terms of the, the uh, footing the bill, so to speak, uh, but it's the state who actually undertakes so the... So which state um, has the most truck stops that look after, looks after the truckies? Truck stops or rest truck, areas? Well, rest area, well, truck stops. Truck you're, stops. You're talking about facilities, all right? Yeah, we so, talk yeah. Um, yeah. heavy vehicle rest areas as yeah. well. So, so. Yeah. Heavy, heavy vehicle... vehicle. I, I couldn't give you a comparison as to which state might be doing better than another, but um, certainly re rest areas generally, I think you'd find across the country are, are in short supply, like decent rest areas, uh, and certainly not plotted in a sense of where you've got decent accommodation available every two hours or so on intercapital routes. But I I'd also like to bring the attention of the committee back to about 10% about of freight runs across borders. You know, about 90% is intrastate. Mm. Now, in Queensland, you could be an intrastate operator and still be doing pretty big kilometres because, you know, it's such a highly decentralised state. Um, there's, uh, there's plenty of fleets I can think of who strictly do intrastate who are doing just as many Ks as plenty of line haul uh, operators who are running across borders. So we, we are always looking for improvement and or... Um, greater supply of, of rest areas. Um, you know, the, the Bruce Highway is, is an area that needs, um, I mean, one particular shortcoming I could point out is, you know, the gap between, say, Jinjin Jin and Brisbane. Um, once you pull out of Jinjin Jin and coming oh, south... I've got that here, yes. Yeah. There's, um, Where is it? You're right, it's fairly absent. <laughs> so, um, uh, as it happens, you know, the um, there is a lot more attention being paid to the Bruce, and there are there have been processes put in place to draw industry opinion in a lot better in terms of um, providing advice in that space. So we're, we're looking for improvement there uh, with, with rest area provision. But, you know, I'd, yeah. there'd be plenty of um, drivers who'd be um, metaphorically throwing a bit of rotten fruit my way if I didn't mention sharing rest areas with um, caravans. But they shouldn't, have, they shouldn't so be allowed in our rest areas. We need, a better, we need a better solution for the way rest areas are shared sure. with uh, what, what you might generally call the, the Grey areas. Army yeah. um, uh, once they're out on the road. So truck rest areas are provided for trucks who have rest. I mean, I, I had a call from a driver... Um, Yesterday morning, where he'd um, he'd pulled into a truck stop that's not a huge distance from here. It's um, I, I shouldn't mention it, but it's this side of Caboolture and uh, the other side of Aspley. <laughs> and and uh, he'd pulled in that morning to uh, to take a seven hour break, and um, there wasn't a single spot left. Every, yeah, every single spot was taken by a caravan. I have a very um, clear view. They shouldn't be in our uh, rest. That's that's not a unique experience. It was. Right. Um, right. uh, but. 
that particular individual took the opportunity to give me a call just to say, you know, I've just pulled in. So that, yeah. I know that's a little anecdotal story, but, but that's the sort of experience people have. And uh, we need to do better in terms of the way rest areas are both provided, but also signalled and signed so that it's, it's clear what they're there for the use of. Gary, we've got about three minutes left, mate, but I really want to throw this to you. What is QTA doing to attract young entrants into the industry and women? Now, this has really come from a different... I, I just don't want you to go until I get your views on that. Well, in a general sense, I, I think our employers are doing reasonably OK in trying to uh, attract... I should say your members, sorry. Yeah, attract, uh, you know, a, a broader um, uh, cohort of people to, to the industry. We, uh, we are working much more closely these days with the likes of TAFE. Um, uh, the uh, Department of Small Business here is just um, uh, doing some work with us at the moment on micro-credentialing, so that we, we are looking to try and uh, raise the level of understanding of people of the opportunities that are available in this industry. Mm. Yes, truck, truck drivers are uh, probably the feature but there's a lot of other uh, opportunity within the industry and a whole variety of different roles. Yep. So uh, even if you go right back to um, you know career counselling in schools, mm. I think you'd go through a fair few schools to find a career counsellor who'd mention... I don't think you'd find one. ...road freight mm. uh, as, an, as an opportunity. I think mine said to me, while well, you're going young still, you'll be a truck driver. For a lot oh, of kids. Correct. So <laughs> there's plenty of truck drivers who've become business owners. Uh, in fact, the greater majority of uh, trucking businesses uh, would be owned and operated by people who originally started off as a uh, truck driver. So it is a, it is a great opportunity to, um, to get a start and, and grow into um, a successful business. Uh, but there's a, a whole raft of other opportunity in logistics, yeah. you know, scheduling, allocating, you know, HR. Um, is there any government support, Gary, uh, federal or state in that area? Um, there, are, there is some. Uh, some of the focus has been on uh, retraining in some states uh, where, where there's been, uh, for example, Victoria has provided a fair level of support for a lot of people who, who um, uh, made redundant through the vehicle manufacturing sector um, coming to a, um, a halt. Um, but in, in this state, we, we get a level of support. We, uh, we're doing better. Um, we provide um, quite a bit of intel to a variety of uh, departments about where, where the opportunities are and where the training needs are mm. um, and where um, uh, job opportunities are. Um, Micro-credentialing is a way of getting people started and grow their confidence to, to look to bigger and better things. Um, but we also need to do a lot better in, in uh, telling our story so that people understand how much opportunity there is in this industry. And, yeah. And what, you know, I think one of the, one of the things that's elevated uh, the profile of our industry is, is um, COVID-19 of all things. Um, a lot more people have started to understand um, how, how necessary it is that the freight supply chain uh, continues to function the way yeah. that it does and the importance of it uh, to our communities. Because in many respects, our industry is sort of semi-invisible to a lot of people in the community. They just, they just think, um, you know, food appears in a supermarket via yeah. an apparition or something. Sure. Um, you know, they're building supplies, um, you know, freight to market, exports, etc. Medicines. Even though sure. trucks drive past them, they don't sort of contextualise why that's such an important link to the standard of living in their community. So just on the coronal, I was talking earlier and... Um, uh, and I just was amazed to think that if drivers have limited hours to fulfil shifts and yet there is no designated truck... Um, uh, no, 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 uh, uh, lane for people crossing the borders under COVID. So what does that mean? You're taking in an extra couple Gary's, of hours? Gary's aged the last three weeks, 20 years. He's only 25. <laughs> well, there, I mean, I would have thought there has that, been, that there has been critical. Up, up until relatively recent times, there has been, has been an express lane at our borders. Um, but once the, um, the rules changed so that our drivers had to have um, a de border declaration, 
which fundamentally is a, a version of contact tracing. Um, that, yeah. that slowed the system down quite a bit because um, our people are being stopped just as much as anybody else now uh, and having their declarations uh, checked. So... Well, they wouldn't have um, their own dedicated lane either. No. We no. So mm. we have been talking to the police a fair bit uh, and they are looking to try and optimise freight as best they can. But at the same time, um, you know, they're... Um, I mean, this is just my observation, but... You know, with the behaviour of some, you know, hiding in boots and, you know, in the back of vans and the variety of things, it raises the level of anxiety of police who are standing on these borders. Yeah. Who wants to be the officer who let, you know, a group get through? Mm. Uh, so a whole lot more checking is being done that might not have otherwise mm. occurred because the anxiety levels have risen to such an extent that um, they're not going to take any chances. So. And we we just happen to be a consequence of that. So, but when you when you look at the overall performance over the last four or five months, I mean the, the industry has put in a remarkable yeah, effort. There's, there's not been an infection breakout in that supply chain. Yeah. I would argue our industry has really taken the ball up uh, very strongly. And um, um, you know you, you, there may well be examples of some who have not taken it as a responsibility. Uh, as responsibly as they should have, but all in all, you'd have to say the effort has been, um, you know, significant. Here, here. And I think that's very much reflected in the fact that we have not had a, an infection break yet. I think that, and on that, look, Gary, I think you, uh, we have run out of time. And I do want to thank you very much for coming today. We know where to find you, should we need to follow anything up. Uh, what we'll do now is take a one hour suspension and we'll be back here at quarter past two. Quarter past two? Yeah where we will hear from Livestock and Rural Transporters Association of Queensland. Thank you. Thank you.